Brooks, starring Eve Arden. In the year she has been teaching English at Madison High, Armis Brooks has learned a few cardinal rules concerning her principal, Mr. Conklin. One was to be punctual always. Another was to be agreeable at all times. And a third was, never cross your principal until you came to him. <laughs> Bearing this in mind, when Mr. Conklin suggested a method a few weeks ago of beating the high price of meat, I listened very carefully. His idea was for a few of us to chip in with him and buy a whole steer and keep it in a frozen food plant. Thus, it would make good meat available to us at a reasonable price whenever we wanted it. The scheme sounded feasible, so my landlady, Mrs. Davis, and Mr. Boynton and I joined the Conklins in his project. It worked perfectly until this past week. Thursday morning started out just like any of the others had since Ferdinand had entered our lives. Connie, you've hardly eaten a thing. Don't you like your breakfast this morning? I should say I do, Mrs. Davis. This beef stew is delicious. <laughs> but I've had enough of it. I had a hunch you'd say that. You should. I've been saying it since Monday. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to serve this four-day-old stuff, Connie. But since we bought that steer, we've had more meat than we know what to do with. And anyway, I... Oh, that's probably Walter to pick me up. Come on in, Walter. The door's open. I hope he brought his appetite with him. Maybe he'll do away with some of this meat. Or vice versa. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Good morning, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Walter. You look a bit gloomy, dear. Yeah, I am. Would you like a bite to eat? That usually cheers you up. Yeah, what do you got? How about a slab of beef on a nice pointed stick? You no know, thanks. <laughs> now, I'm in big trouble with Harriet Conklin. Well, why not sit down and try a little of our stew? That ought to make you forget Harriet for a while. That ought to make him forget everything for a while. <laughs> You're eating beef stew for breakfast? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We've been battling it for the past four days now, Walter. Well, well, the way I feel this morning, I couldn't eat a thing. I'm never hungry when Harriet isn't talking to me. What happened this time? Well, it all started over a little thing at the Conklin's last night. I was sitting in the living room with Harriet and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin when suddenly Harriet spied a large insect. A praying mantis, to be exact. Well, they're perfectly harmless, but you've never heard two women scream the way Harriet and Mrs. Conklin did. Oh, oh, they were terrified. Well, in the midst of the commotion, Mr. Conklin calmly took off his shoe and killed the thing. What's that got to do with Harriet not talking to you? Well, I began kidding her about the fact that girls always go to pieces in an emergency. So one word led to another, and she ended up not speaking to me. Well, I guess I shouldn't have teased her about something that's obviously so true. You mean you really believe that men react better to emergencies than girls do? Your present got me accepted, of course. <laughs> but then I never think of you as a girl, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Thanks a million. <laughs> what I mean is you'd never get into a panic over a little thing like an insect. Of course you wouldn't. Neither of us would. Oh, I know it, Mrs. Davis, but you're different. So, oh, for instance, that little mouse running across the floor doesn't bother you two in the least. Mouse! Ah! You're going up the stairs. Corn, eat it, corn. Shh, shh. There, he's gone, Miss Brooks. You can relax. Oh, I'm perfectly relaxed, Walter. I was just a bit startled, that's all. Yeah, I know. You can get down off that chair now. <laughs> oh, yes. Mm. I'm surprised at you, Connie, climbing up on the chair. Where else could I go? You're on the table. <laughs> oh, so I am. I was wondering how I suddenly got so tall. <laughs> yeah, now, you see what I mean? All women react alike in emergencies. Uh, look, Walter, just because we were a wee bit upset by a mouse is no reason to think we'd be over-emotional under any other circumstances. Please notice how rapidly I return to normal. Right now, I'm as calm as can be. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> All right, Miss Brooks, while you pull yourself together. Hello, Davis residence. Walter Denton speaking. Oh, hello, Walter. This is Mr. Boynton. Could I speak to Miss Brooks, please? You'll have to wait until she gets a grip on herself, Mr. Boynton. Gets a grip on herself? Yeah, she just saw a mouse. Miss Brooks and Mrs. Davis were leaping on chairs and tables like a brace of gazelles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
boy, it almost knocked me out. Hand me that phone or I'll finish the job. <laughs> hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hey, what's this about you and Mrs. Davis leaping on chairs and tables at the sight of a mouse? <laughs> I, I wish I'd been there. <laughs> I wish you had, too. There was an extra chair. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't call up just to laugh at me, Mr. Boynton. Oh, now, don't get sore, Miss Brooks. I'm not sore, Mr. Boynton, not in the least. I suppose you share the popular belief that all women get panicky in emergencies. Well, it's a known fact that men are cooler than women are in tense situations. But it's nothing to get angry about. I told you I'm not angry. If you want to call up and laugh at me, that's your business. If you choose to insult me by telling me how quickly I go to pieces, that's up to you. Oh, but, Miss Brooks, But to accuse I... me of being sore and angry is more than I care to take. The next thing you'll be saying is that I'm mad. That's just what you're thinking, isn't it, Mr. Boynton? Oh, please, Well, Miss for your Brooks, information, I, just... I am neither sore, angry, nor mad, and neither you or anybody else can accuse me of it. Do you hear me, Mr. Boynton? Neither you or anybody else. Oh, Miss Brooks, please try to cool down. I am cool. I'm cute as a cucumber. <laughs> I mean, cool as a cucumber. Oh, good. And I'll tell you what I called about. I know what you called about, and it's typical of your sneaky nature to call when it would embarrass me the most. Goodbye. My goodness, Connie. You shouldn't have gotten so peeved at Mr. Boynton. Well, I hate being told that men can handle emergencies better than women, Mrs. Davis. I know, but there's nothing you can do about it this minute, dear. Maybe not. The way I feel now, if a mantis gets in my way today, he'd better pray. Oh, Miss Brooks, wait up a minute. Oh, good morning, Harriet. Oh, I'm glad I caught you before you went into your first class. I wanted to talk to you. What is it, dear? Well, you've probably heard about the enormous insect at our house last night. Harriet, that's no way to talk about your father. <laughs> oh, you mean the praying mantis. Yes, I've heard about it. Well, since last night, Mother and I have heard so much about male superiority in emergencies that I'm not talking to Walter and Mother's not talking to Daddy. Well, don't look now, but Mr. Boynton's just joined the club. <laughs> you mean you're not speaking to Mr. Boynton either? Why? Was there a praying mantis at your house, too? No, just a mouse. Mrs. Davis and I became a bit unnerved when we saw one, and Walter blabbed about it to Mr. Boynton on the phone. Oh, I see. What about Mrs. Davis's cat, Minerva? It's a good thing she wasn't there. She'd have been more frightened than any of us. <laughs> well, I wish there was something we could do about it. Uh, here you are, Harriet. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. We were just talking about you. Oh, did Harriet tell you how I slew that enormous praying mantis last night? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. I understand you're having it mounted for your trophy room. <laughs> Miss Brooks, casting aspersions on my courage is most ill-timed, coming as it does from one who has spent the better part of the morning perched on a dining room chair. <laughs> Why, that little stool pigeon. I wouldn't have brought up the episode had you not made your disparaging remark. It's hardly necessary to reiterate a truism we are all aware of, that in emergencies, large and small, men are much superior to women. Daddy, you have no right... Silence! <laughs> you wouldn't care to discuss the point further, would you, Miss Brooks? Not with my salary check due tomorrow. <laughs> that is, no, sir. Very well. Now, Harriet, I want you to go home immediately after school and help your mother prepare for our dinner party tonight. She broke her silence long enough to call and tell me she wanted you. All right, Daddy. You're having a big dinner tonight, sir? Uh, yes, Miss Brooks, for several members of the Board of Education. That steer we bought certainly comes in handy. Without it, I could never have invited all those important people. Oh, that reminds me. I'll have to take a trip down to the refrigerator plant this afternoon for some steak. I could lend you some beef stew. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> Well, I've got to get back to my office. I hope you two will voluntarily break up this Kathy clutch. Or will I have to get a mouse and stampede you? <laughs> oh, I said a mouse and stampede. <laughs> oh, I will have my little joke. <laughs> little, that's right. Now, you see, Miss Brooks, doesn't that attitude make you furious? It certainly does, Harriet. There must be some way to eliminate it. There is. But where can we find a long enough wall to line up the male population of the United States? Well, at lunchtime, I was still 
quite incensed over Mr. Boynton's attitude toward female inferiority in emergencies. He must have realized how I felt because as he approached my table in the school cafeteria, he had a peace offering in his hand. Where some men give their girlfriends flowers or candy after an argument, Mr. Boynton's gift was more original. Here, Miss Brooks, I brought you a plate of noodle soup. <laughs> noodle soup? Is this to be construed as a peace feeler, Mr. Boynton? You might say that, yes. Well, it's got a lot of noodles in it. Well, if you think you can bribe me with lavish gifts, you're mistaken. Now, I'll thank you to leave me alone if you have nothing further to say. Oh, but I have, Miss Brooks. Yes? What am I going to do with the soup? Use it as a finger bowl. <laughs> Young rope with the noodle. Excuse me, Mr. Boynton. No, please, Miss Brooks. There's no reason for us to be on the outs like this. Look, do you mind if I sit down for just a minute? There are no reserved seats in the cafeteria, Mr. Boynton, so there's not much I can do about it. Well, I, I don't know how we got into that argument on the phone in the first place. Now, you see, my folks came into town unexpectedly, and you were the first person I thought of to help entertain them. Your folks? Yes. I called to ask you to play hostess at a little dinner party I'm giving them at my place tonight. Well, that's very flattering, Mr. Vine. I thought you'd appreciate it. I mean, you, you've always seemed to like my folks. And, uh, well, now I, I need your services for something else, too. You want me to cook the dinner? No, Dad's stomach hasn't been too strong lately. <laughs> oh, it's not that you aren't a good cook. It's not that I am, either. <laughs> well, I'm in kind of a spot, Miss Brooks. I have no meat for the table tonight and no money to buy any. Well, that shouldn't be any problem. Why don't you go down to the refrigeration plant and hack a few yards off the dinosaur of the cattle world? <laughs> well, that's just it, Miss Brooks. Mr. Conklin forgot to pay the rent on the frozen food locker, and they told him today that none of us could go near our steer until the rent was paid. He doesn't have the money. You know what this means, Miss Brooks. Vegetarianism is about to get some converts. <laughs> Look, I'd like to help you out, Mr. Boynton, but I haven't any money either. Oh, I wouldn't ask you for money, Miss Brooks. But I have a little scheme. The scheme? Mr. Conklin, Mrs. Davis, and I are all known at the locker since we've been there many times to pick up meat. But you've never been there, have you? Not so far. Good. Well, just before closing time, there's only one man on duty. Now, if you could act as a sort of decoy and get him away from his desk for five minutes... I could sneak into the refrigeration room and get some meat. Now, do you follow me? Yeah, but who have we got in the getaway car, Lefty? It's our own steer, Miss Brooks. We'll straighten out the rent bill later on. Now, will you help me? Well, where do you stand on male superiority in emergencies, Mr. Boynton? Oh, now, please, Miss Brooks. This isn't the type of emergency we were talking about. I just meant that women have a tendency to fall apart under pressure. Well, don't look now, but your decoy has just disintegrated. Oh, but Miss Brooks... Sorry, you'll just have to get someone else. <coughs> well, I'm sorry I've made you angry again, but if that's the way you feel about it, I will have to get someone else. There isn't much time, so if you'll excuse me... It's a pleasure. Well, see you later, Miss Brooks. Much later. Of all the nerve, asking me to help him and then... I should have dropped this noodle soup right into his lap. Men are the limit. Sometimes I wish... Well, there's no sense in going overboard. You must have money in the bank. Or were you rehearsing a speech for your class? I'm afraid you're wrong on two counts, Mr. Conklin. No matter. Miss Brooks, I'd like to make amends for my curt treatment this morning. Look, I've brought you a little gift. Why, Mr. Conklin, you shouldn't have. And it's just the color I like, too. Yes, I remembered that you take your coffee black. <laughs> Do you mind if I sit down? Not at all. Take this chair. It's still warm. Uh, to come straight to the point, Miss Brooks, I have a little favor to ask you. I never would have guessed. I wouldn't dream of asking it except in this dire emergency. Could you find it in your tender heart to lend me ten measly dollars until payday? I couldn't find ten measly cents in my measly heart. I'm flat broke, Mr. Conklin. I was afraid of that. Mr. Boynton told me the predicament you're both in, and you have my sympathy, sir, but... I'm going to need more than your sympathy, Miss Brooks. You see, I need some meat desperately for tonight. And the little plan I've invented to get it requires your help. Yeah, but who have we got in the getaway car, Lefty? <laughs> I beg your pardon? 
Does the plan involve my acting as a decoy for the lone man in the refrigerator plant while you lope into the locker room and pill for some protein? What? Yes, yes. But how did you know? I've seen the picture. <laughs> uh, Mr. Boynton has a similar plan. And since you share the same low opinion of female behavior in emergencies, my answer to you is the same I gave Mr. Boynton. No, Mr. Conklin. No? I'm afraid you're barking up the wrong duck. <laughs> Miss Brooks, allow me to point out that there is a difference between Mr. Boynton's position and mine. A difference? Yes. I happen to be the principal of this institution, and as I have pointed out in the past, it is within my power to make your life here either pleasant or extremely unpleasant. <laughs> now, my dear, what is your answer? <laughs> Acting as a decoy for the man in charge of the food locker seemed like the only way Mr. Conklin, or anyone else for that matter, was going to get a whack at our mammoth steer. So shortly before five that afternoon, we entered the refrigeration plant and approached the locker in front of which the man was sitting. Well, there's the man at that desk, Miss Brooks. Now, we've only got five minutes till closing time, so we've got to move fast. Well, I'll take care of him, Mr. Conklin. You just watch for a chance and sneak into the refrigeration room. Right. Good luck, Miss Brooks. Uh, pardon me, sir, but you've got to direct me to the owner of this company at once. I've got to see him immediately. It's urgent. Well, uh, ju just a minute, madam. What's the trouble? This is the Premium Meat Company, isn't it? Yes. Then I'd better talk to Mr. Premium. <laughs> It's an emergency. But there is no Mr. Premium. I'm in charge here, lady. All the others have gone home. Oh, well, then you'd better come immediately. Something terrible has happened. Where? Where? Oh, out front. There's been a dreadful accident. A car just crashed into the back of your delivery truck and ruined the whole thing. A delivery truck? But, but I didn't hear anything. It was one of those silent, sneaky crashes. <laughs> Demolished the whole front end of it. The front end? But, but you said the car crashed into the back of it. What are you, a district attorney or a meat watcher? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a mess. You'd better go out and take a look. Well, if it's as bad as you say, there's nothing to be gained by going out now. I might as well wait five minutes until closing time. Closing time? Well, that's too late. I mean, this won't wait. It isn't only the truck that's damaged. The crash ruined the rear end of the car in front of it. Well, then it's my car. Bingo. <laughs> I'd better have a look, although I'm not supposed to leave this desk until closing time. Oh, I'll keep an eye on things for you. Believe me, I'll call you the minute the hamburger gets restless. <laughs> you just go right ahead. Well, oh, okay, I'll be just a couple of months. Now to get to that refrigeration room and give Mr. Conklin a hand. Ooh, it's cold in here. Mr. Conklin? Mr. Conklin, are you in here? Over here, Miss Brooks, in this third row of steers. Where, Mr. Conklin? Right here, Miss Brooks. What's the matter? Don't you recognize me? Oh, of course. You're the blue one without the government stamp. <laughs> that is, you're not wearing your glasses, Mr. Conklin. I know. It's so confoundedly cold in here, my breath fogged them so I couldn't see. Now, give me a hand with this steer and we'll get out. Well, Miss Brooks, didn't you hear me? You're talking to a leg of lamb. I'm over here. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, sure. Well, <laughs> let's, let's get going. It's so cold I can hardly stand it. Say, our steer hasn't got half as much meat on it as I thought. Please let go of my arm, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, perhaps I'd better go... How did he get back so soon? Quiet, Miss Brooks. Just remain perfectly silent. You won't know we're here. Well, now we can talk. Wait a minute. It's five o'clock. He's closing for the night. Closing for the night? Come on, Miss Brooks. Hey, 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 hey. There is someone in here. Let us out. Let us out. Come back. It's Come. no use, Mr. Conklin. The door is so thick he can't hear us. But he's got to hear us. Somebody's got to hear us. We'll freeze to death in here. Now be calm, Mr. Conklin. Be calm, yes, yes. That's it, that's it. <laughs> We've got to do 
something, Miss Brooks. We'll freeze in here. Why, it won't take an hour, and we'll be as stiff as these stairs. And now, Mr. Conk. I don't want to die. <laughs> Please, Miss Brooks, don't let me die. I'll do anything you ask, anything. Well, first, brush the sawdust off your knees. But I can't stand this cold. I can't stand it, I tell you. I'm going. I can sense it already. My whole life is beginning to unravel before my eyes. Oh, please, Mr. Conklin, we're not drowning. We're only freezing to death. <laughs> what am I saying? Oh, but it's true. I can feel the icy hand of the grim reaper on my throat. Your tie is caught in the pig's knuckles. <laughs> now, look, Mr. Conklin, I'm, I'm sure we won't be abandoned in here. Somebody will... What was that? It came from behind that big ham. What big ham? It's me. Who's m- 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 me? Mr. Boynton. Uh, I sneaked in about five minutes ago when the refrigerator door was open. And there was n- no one on guard. Well, Walter came along to help me. Walter. Yeah. yeah, it's chilly in here, isn't it? Well, it's starting to get chillier. We're locked in for the night. Locked in? For the night? But we'll... Freeze to death! Who do you know? The Andrews Brothers. <laughs> oh, Miss Brooks, this is terrible. I don't want to die. I'm too young to die. I'm too important to die. to die. I'm just decorative myself. <laughs> you three he-men will stop shivering for a minute. But I can't. I'm afraid. I just want to go. I... What's that? Oh, the door's opening. This way, madam. Thank heaven they're American. <laughs> Americans. Whom were you expecting? Laplanders. <laughs> what are you doing here, Mrs. Davis? My brother Victor and his wife dropped in for dinner, so I came down to get some meat. Luckily, I caught this man as he was leaving the building. Yeah, and if she hadn't paid part of the rent you owe on your locker, she never would have gotten in. Oh, what a break. It was extremely fortunate for all of us that you got here, Margaret. Especially for me. I certainly exploded the myth of male superiority in emergencies. Oh, I don't know. We weren't that panicky, Miss Brooks. You weren't, huh? Well, do you know something, Mr. Boynton? What? After seeing you three in action, I'll never be afraid of any other mice again. And now, here's the star of our show, Eve Arden. Well, such a demonstration of male superiority can only mean a superior headache. Armist Brooks, starring Eve Arden, Clance Clark, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Oldberg and Al Lewis, for the music of Lud Gluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, and Joel Samuel. Over this same station, Eve Arden, in the role of Madison High School's favorite English teacher, Miss Brooks, will again call the student body together. Don't you be absent. Our Miss Brooks is presented each week through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Brooks, starring Eve Arden. In the years she has been teaching English at Madison High School, our Miss Brooks has helped to initiate many projects there, and the results have been amazingly consistent. Yes, 
almost every one of them has been a flop. <laughs> However, a few months ago, I had given our principal the idea of introducing a pen pal project. In other words, those students and teachers at Madison who wanted to do so could pick the names of some students or teachers in a foreign country and correspond with them. Well, two months of all this goodwill certainly had its effect, especially on Mr. Boynton. Last Thursday morning at breakfast, I must have shown my concern because my landlady's first remark was... It's hopeless to try to hide your feelings from me, Connie. Now, what's troubling you this morning? It's Mr. Boynton, Miss Davis. Is Daisy Enright chasing him again? Constantly. Every time I look behind me, there she is. But this has nothing to do with her, Mrs. Davis. It's my new rival who's worrying me. Your new rival? Who's she, Connie? Her name's Yvette Jouvet, and she lives in Paris. What? Who's Yvette Jouvet? I am. <laughs> Just sit right there, dear, and I'll get you a damp cloth for your forehead. <laughs> no, I'm serious, Mrs. Davis. A few months ago, some of the students and teachers began corresponding with some foreign students and teachers. But what's that got to do with you and Yvette Jouvet? Well, I thought this would be an ideal time to see whether Mr. Boynton really cares about me or not. So I put the fictitious name of Yvette Jouvet on the list of names we got from the U.N., knowing that he'd correspond with her. But how could you be so sure? After her name, I added French high school biologist. And to make doubly sure, I tacked on frogs a specialty. <laughs> so we've been corresponding ever since. But I still don't see how you got his letters and he got yours. Well, the letters were all written from and sent to school. So I bought some canceled French stamps in a hobby shop. And since Walter Denton was working in the mailroom, it was no trick at all for him to intercept Mr. Boynton's letters for me. Well, I never. And how has your rivalry with Yvette worked out? I can answer that in three words. Vive la France. <laughs> what do you mean, dear? In my very first letter, I sent him a picture of a French movie star, which I clipped from a magazine, and I told him this was Yvette. He showed his affection almost immediately. He sent you a picture right back. That's right, of his pet frog, McDougal. <laughs> Since then, his letters have become more amorous, and I've become more furious. But there's still no reason for you to be so upset, Connie. Oh, yes, there is, Mrs. Davis. I was so angry after his last letter, I wrote him that Yvette was coming to America. What? She's due to arrive today. Well, don't be too upset, Connie. Maybe something will happen. Maybe she'll be quarantined, or she won't get through customs, or... Oh, oh, I forgot. You're Yvette. Yes, and I'm anxious to have a showdown with myself once and for all. If Mr. Boynton doesn't come clean about Yvette of his own free will, it's all over between us. No, I wouldn't. Oh, that must be Walter Denton. Be out in a minute, Walter. I'd better get ready, Mrs. Davis. All right, dear. But please think it over carefully before you do anything drastic about Mr. Boynton. I've made up my mind. He's got to choose between Yvette and Connie. But what if he chooses Yvette? Then he'll have no one. <laughs> and if he chooses Connie? I'll go back to France and forget him. <laughs> Come on, Walter, out with it. There's something troubling you this morning. What is it? It's Harriet, Miss Brooks. After all these years, she's in love with somebody else. Really? Who? His name's Giuseppe Umberto Mozzarella. <laughs> He's an Italian. I never would have guessed. You still haven't answered my question. Just who is Giuseppe? I am... <laughs> Walter, what are you talking about? Well, I got the idea from you, Miss Brooks I decided to test her love for me And I included the fictitious name of Giuseppe Mozzarella of Rome In the list of students to correspond with <laughs> I knew she'd write to him How could you be sure? After his name, I wrote Handsome Latin Lover <laughs> You've probably been corresponding with every other girl in school, too uh, How has your rivalry with Giuseppe worked out? I can answer that in two words, Miss Brooks. Viva Italia! <laughs> so you've been Harriet's pen pal, hmm? 
Pal is hardly the word for it. We've been singeing off each other's eyebrows through the mail. <laughs> well, there's nothing to be so depressed about. After all, your rival is still safely tucked away in Italy. You know, well, that's just it, Miss Brooks. I got so furious at her last letter, I decided on a showdown. I wrote her that Giuseppe's coming to this country to visit her. What? Yeah, I'm arriving in the next few days. <laughs> she should have gotten my letter yesterday afternoon. This school is certainly going to be loaded with out-of-towners. <laughs> I'm arriving today, too. That is, Yvette Jouvet is. Say, wait a minute. I just thought of something extremely depressing. What is it? Suppose Mr. Conklin intercepts your letter about Giuseppe's arrival. He knows I'm behind the pen pal plan, and if he sees the letter, it can only mean one thing. What's that? Mr. Mozzarella may be coming from Rome and Miss Jouvet from Paris, but Miss Brooks is on her way to Siberia. <laughs> I've been thinking, Miss Brooks. You're right about Mr. Conklin. If he saw that letter this morning and you had to face him, you would be in trouble. Of course I would. Later on, he might not be quite so mad. Now, just a few steps more and we'll be past his office. Walter, take your head out from under your coat. We don't have to sneak along like thieves. Mr. Conklin, watch out! No! Yes! Oh, oh, I'm sorry, sir. I was only trying not to disturb you in case... Quiet, Brendan. You... <laughs> I have a word of warning for you, young man. Warning, sir? National Peanut Week is coming up. And if I were you, I'd put a sign on my head. <laughs> what kind of a sign? A sign saying, this is a head. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Brooks. Oh, I'll run along, too, I think, Walter. It's late. Just a moment, Miss Brooks. It so happens I wanted to see you. It's about a certain letter. A certain letter, Mr. Conklin? <laughs> <laughs> yes, tiny Tim. <laughs> a letter. It came from one Giuseppe Mozzarella of Rome, Italy, and was sent to my daughter, Harriet. I steamed it open by mistake. I opened it by mistake Well, yes, sir, but how does that concern me? Because, Miss Brooks, this pen pal project was your feeble brain child I foresaw trouble in this idea from the beginning And now the calamity has come to pass Calamity? Surely it's not that serious, Mr. Conklin It isn't, eh? Suppose you listen to the last part of the letter from this teenage Roman Casanova to my daughter. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a thinker to myself. Do I love her? Must you? Do I need her? Must you? Do I want her? Must you? So I take my savings and come to America to visit. See you in a week of my little lasagna. <laughs> Always, you Giuseppe. Well, Miss Brooks, isn't that revolting? My shoe. <laughs> but now, Miss Brooks, I have an important statement to make to you. Yes, sir. Because of this international juvenile catastrophe, I am discontinuing your pet project. But, Mr. Conklin, Furthermore, I... it will be your job to play chaperone to this amorous antipasto when he does arrive. <laughs> Just so you keep all future ideas of this type entirely to yourself, I have a little project of my own for you to embark on. It starts at my house tonight and continues through the next three weeks. Tonight? Oh, but, sir, I, I can't Miss possibly... Brooks, I... I've made my decision. <laughs> <laughs> You have nothing more to say? Just one thing, sir. What's that? Mrs. Davis was right. Yvette will never get through customs. <laughs> At lunch, as I approached our usual table in the cafeteria, I was only sure of one thing that regardless of what happened, Mr. Boynton would take everything in his usual serene fashion. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Boynton. Ah! Oh, Miss Brooks! 
What an enthusiastic greeting. <laughs> you make me feel like the Witch of Endor. <laughs> it's just that you startled me for a minute. Oh? Would you care to tell me what you're so upset about? Upset? Oh, I'm not upset, Miss Brooks. No, not in the least. Uh, have you decided what you want for lunch yet? And not yet. Let's see. I think I'll start off with some onion soup. French onion soup. <laughs> you dropped your knife, Mr. Boynton. Then I'll have some potatoes. French fried. <laughs> you dropped your fork, Mr. Boynton. Uh, I guess I am a bit jumpy today. Well, maybe you'll feel more like telling me what's bothering you tonight. <laughs> We have a date to go to the movies, remember? I'm dying to see the new picture at the Gaiety. Well, what's playing there? The last time I saw Paris. <laughs> Darn these slippery plates. <laughs> Look, Mr. Boynton, why don't you calm down? Oh, but I am. I'm perfectly calm. Pardon me, Mr. Boynton. No! <laughs> well, what's the matter, Mr. Boynton? Oh. I'm sorry, Harriet. Something came up today that made me a bit jumpy. A bit jumpy? His frog, McDougal, could take lessons. <laughs> well, if you don't mind, Mr. Boynton, I'd like to see Miss Brooks alone for a minute. Oh, certainly, Harriet. I'll go up and get some coffee. I'll see you in a little while, Miss Brooks. There are two schools of thought on that. <laughs> now, what is it you wanted to see me about, Harriet? Well, I think that Daddy's attitude since I got that letter from Giuseppe is disgraceful. Well, your father certainly is furious with me, Harriet. Not only do I have to work at his house every night for the next three weeks, but he's discontinuing pen pals as well. He certainly soured on that little project. Oh, he only acts that way because you suggested the idea, Miss Brooks. Why, for the last month, he's been secretly corresponding with a Viennese principal he got off the list. A uh, uh, Fräulein Gretchen Schneider. <laughs> Fräulein Gretchen Schneider? Does anyone else know about this, Harriet? Oh, not a soul, Miss Brooks. He writes the letters at home, but he gives the school as his return address. How do you know all this? I uh, accidentally steamed open one in the mail room. <laughs> <laughs> Harriet, you dear child. I think you've pointed a way out of the wilderness for me. What do you mean? What are you going to do? Achtung, Mädchen, we will see what we will see. <laughs> I hope this works. I haven't heard any German spoken since my last Eric von Stroheim picture. <laughs> Also, this is the home of Herr Conklin? Yeah, this is the home of Herr... <laughs> I mean, Mr. Conklin speaking. Herr Conklin, Liebchen, here is your little Fräulein Schneider from Vienna. Oh, you must have the wrong number. I've never been abroad in my life. I simply don't know any. Fräulein Schneider from Vienna! <laughs> I can hear you so clearly, I swear you were right around the corner. Well, that's because I am right around the corner. In second, I'm in the drugstore. <laughs> My train just got in from New York. What? What, what are you doing in the drugstore? Talking to you, my little pizza pie. <laughs> my pumpernickel. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Should I come over right now? No, 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 don't do that. No, of course not. No, uh, Fräulein Schneider, this is most embarrassing. I, I saw no reason to mention this in my letters, but uh, I'm, I'm married. Oh, that's all right. I wait till the divorce is final. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm happily married. My wife doesn't know anything about you. Well, then we tell her. <laughs> she must be a very understanding Frau. You don't know this Frau. <laughs> <laughs> how, how did you locate me? Well, when I arrive today, I go to the schoolhouse where I was writing you the letters. And the Miss Brooks told me where you were. You would. 
But uh, you, you must come over here. Under no circumstances come here. I, I, I'll come to where you are right after dinner tonight. Have you got some place you can stay till then? Ah, oh, yeah. Miss Brooks said I could stay at her house a bit. What a woman that Miss Brooks is. I wish I had her in my school in Vienna. I wish you did, too. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll see you later at her house. Wunderbar. When will you be at the house? Oh, uh, well, I'll be there as close to eight as I can. I'll tell you all about my wife at that time. Good. <laughs> then at ten after eight, we call a lawyer. <laughs> I'll be the same, Pupchen. Well, I felt that I had found the three ingredients that might save my pen pal project at Madison. Ingredient one, Mr. Conklin had been corresponding secretly, but innocently, with a female Viennese school principal. Two, said Viennese principal had misinterpreted the letters and had come to America to find Mr. Conklin. And three, I was the Viennese principal. And four, if my idea didn't work, I could probably get a job dishing out schnitzel a la Holstein in some Hofbrau. <laughs> that evening at home, Mrs. Davis and I were waiting for Mr. Conklin. Well, Mr. Conklin ought to be here any time now, Mrs. Davis. I certainly hope your plan works, Connie. It's got to. It's the only thing that will save my pen pal project and keep me from doing night work for the next three weeks. But what about Mr. Boynton? That kind of night work, I don't mind. <laughs> oh, you mean, what have I done about him? Well, I'm glad you mentioned it, Mrs. Davis. I'd better call him and tell him Mademoiselle Jouvet has arrived. I guess you know what you're doing, Connie, but I wish I did. Hello? Hello? Is Philip Boynton there? Well, this is Philip. Uh, this is Philip Boynton. <laughs> Philip, mon cher Philip, this is votre petite Yvette, Yvette Jouvet. Are you surprised that I have come? Surprised is hardly the word. Uh, where are you now? At the railroad station. Uh, shall I call for you, Miss Jouvet? Oh, no, no, Philippe. It would take too long. I take the taxi and come right over to your house. Oh, but, but Miss Jouvet... I will see you too sweet. Au revoir, mon amour. Now, Mrs. Davis, if you really want to help me, you'll do exactly as I say. Of course, Connie. Uh-oh, here it comes. First of all, I want you to go right into your sitting room and stay there. All right, Connie. But what about the door? I'll take care of that. Did you hear, Miss Brooks? Did you get here? Did oh, you... come in, Mr. Conklin. We've been expecting you. Uh, where is she? Where? 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 Fräulein Schneider's in the other room talking to Mrs. Davis. Now, try to calm yourself, Mr. Conklin. I've never seen you this nervous. You'd be nervous, too, if your marriage was at stake. What marriage is that? You know what I mean. If my wife ever finds out about this Fräulein Schneider, I'm ruined. Mr. Conklin, maybe I can help you out of this mess. Oh, would you, Miss Brooks? Would you talk to her? <laughs> Tell her my situation. Convince her that she should go home to Vienna. If you'll do this for me, Miss Brooks, I'll do anything you ask. Anything at all. Name it. It's yours. Will you see to it that the pen pal project continues? Why, I wouldn't dream of discontinuing it. And I'll never have to work at your house at night again. Not even if I have to do it, heaven forbid, myself. <laughs> now, you will talk to her, won't you? I've been talking to her, Miss Conklin. I know what your home life means to you, and I've practically convinced her to leave already. I'll go back and put the finishing touches on it right now. You don't even have to see her if you don't want to. Oh, that would be wonderful, Miss Brooks. I don't know how to thank you. Well, we'll think of something. Now, you wait right here, and I'll be back in a few minutes. Well, here I am back again, Fräulein Schneider. Fräulein Schneider. I'm Mrs. Davis, remember? <laughs> this is for Mr. Conklin's benefit. We're trying to convince her to go back to Vienna. Was that mein lieber Asgut at the door, Miss Brooks? Ach, I must see him. I used must. Himmel, what a letter writer. Now, now, Fräulein Schneider, remember what we talked about. You wouldn't want to break up a family, would you? Why not? It ain't my family. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, I guess you're right. I would never forgive myself, huh? 
Oh, of course you wouldn't. And I know if you took one look at Mr. Conklin, you'd fall madly in love with him. No woman can resist that mustache. <laughs> oh, but I must see Osgood. Use one. No, Fräulein Schneider. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, Connie. With a dummy on your knee, you'd be a sensation. <laughs> it's for your own good not to see him, Fräulein Schneider. Then that's what I'll do. I wouldn't see him. Also, Miss Brooks, you tell him I will write when I get back to Vienna. And Miss Brooks? Yes, Fräulein Schneider? Tell him ich liebe him loads. I'll give him your message at once. <laughs> well, it's all settled, sir. Fräulein Schneider said that I, you... Never mind, Miss Brooks. I overheard everything. Osgood Conklin will never forget what you've done for him today. I hope Osgood Conklin doesn't. Oh, uh, and Miss Brooks? Yes, sir? I had no idea you felt that way about my mustache. <laughs> Be on my way home now. Back to the snug harbor of connubial felicity and my little... Now, who's that? Mr. Boynton, what are you doing here? Miss Brooks, I had to see you. Something's been bothering me terribly. I have a confession to make to you. Well, come in, Boynton, come in. Go out, Mr. Boynton, go out. <laughs> that is, do come in. Hello, Mr. Conklin. Forgive my aggressiveness, but this is something that won't wait, Miss Brooks. I, I must tell you at once. Oh, later, Mr. Boynton, later. Much, much later. Well, what's bothering you, Boynton? Out with it. Uh, well, Miss Brooks, I would wait to tell you alone, but this girl is probably at my house now, and there's no time. What girl? My pen pal, Yvette Jouvet, arrived from Paris this afternoon. From Paris? Well, immigration is certainly booming today. <laughs> The great light is beginning to dawn. From where I'm standing, things were never blacker. <laughs> Just how did Yvette Jouvet arrive, Mr. Boynton? Well, by train from New York. She phoned me from the station ten minutes ago. Mm. Hmm. And Fräulein Schneider arrived by train from New York a couple of hours ago. The only trains that stop here from New York arrive at 8 a.m.? And 8 p.m. Maybe one was early and one was late. <laughs> Wait a minute. Oh, of course, I see it all now. There is no Yvette Jouvet. And there is no Fräulein Schneider. You know what this means? Yes, sir. There is now no Miss Brooks. <laughs> well, since we all... Excuse me. Hello? Yeah, hello, Miss Brooks. This is Walter. I finally got it off my chest. I didn't think it was fair to Harriet, so I told her I was Giuseppe Mozzarella. Well, it didn't happen quite that way with me, but my impersonations of Fräulein Schneider and Yvette Jouvet were exposed, too, Walter. And you know something? What? It's going to take all three of us to do the work Mr. Conklin's about to give me. <laughs> Au revoir, au wiedersehen, and arrivederci. <laughs> Here's the star of our show, Eve Arden. Wouldn't it be something if Mr. Boynton really did start corresponding with a French mamselle? What do I care? I'm not afraid. I'll match my complexion with hers any time. Our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden, Frank Grodd, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Oldsburg and Al Lewis, with the music of Lud Gluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Next week at this same time and over this same station, in the role of Madison High School's favorite English teacher, Miss Brooks, will again call the student body together. Don't you be absent. Our Miss Brooks is presented each week 
to the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. Well, in the years that our Miss Brooks has been teaching English at Madison High School, she has established some mighty fine relationships, not only with her fellow teachers, but in the outside world as well. No better example is my relationship with Mrs. Margaret Davis, my landlady. And the reason we get along so well is because we cooperate so thoroughly. For instance, when I have a problem, I don't hesitate a minute. I bring it right to Mrs. Davis. And whenever she has a problem, she keeps it to herself. However, last Thursday morning at breakfast, I could tell something was bothering her. I know something's troubling you, Mrs. Davis. Won't you tell me what it is? Uh, it's nothing, Connie. Here's your coffee, dear. Thanks. You know you'll feel better if you get whatever's annoying you off your chest. I told you, Connie, it's nothing. Now drink your coffee and stop worrying. All right. If you say it's nothing, I guess it's nothing. I may lose this house in a few days. <laughs> now that's what I call a very high-class nothing. Did you say you might lose this house? Yes. There's a payment due on the mortgage, and I just don't have the money. But that's happened before. Why, I remember in 1953, I owed you six weeks back rent. Of course, things were a lot tougher then. I know. You only owe me five weeks rent now. <laughs> Not that that would solve it. You see, in the past, when an installment came due, Mr. Humphreys always handled the matter personally. He was the manager of the Broadview Realty Company. Isn't Mr. Humphreys in charge now? No, he isn't. You see, he was always most lenient with me. In fact, many the time he'd just write paid on my account months before I got the money together. Now, Mr. Humphreys has been transferred. Where to, Alcatraz? <laughs> oh, I know I shouldn't kid when you're so worried, Mrs. Davis, but it is a coincidence you're mentioning real estate trouble this morning. Madison High School's been having its own property problem. What kind of a problem, Connie? Well, you know the three acres that adjoin the school grounds. Yes. Mr. Conklin's been trying to buy them so we can build a more suitable athletic field. But so far, the old skinflint who owns the land won't sell. It makes me furious. You? But since when have you been so interested in athletics? Since I found out that one of the acres won't be used for the field, but could be used for picnics and strolls during lunch hour through beautiful trees and shrubs with a certain beautiful biology teacher named Philip Boynton. <laughs> the woodland paradise. But I've seen that property, Connie. Why, once you get into the trees, the shrubbery's so thick you can't stroll six feet. That's what I say. It's a woodland paradise. <laughs> Better get ready for school. Walter Denton's picking me up any minute. Now, don't you worry too much about the installment on your mortgage. Maybe the man who replaces Mr. Humphreys at the realty company will be even more patient than he was. Oh, I'm not going to brood about it, Connie. After all, life is short and so am I, I always say. <laughs> is that what you always say? I used to always say that, too, but I outgrew it when I was 12. <laughs> Car looks very good this morning, Walter. Has something new been added? It's just you, oh exquisite educator. <laughs> but I've got more important things than this jalopy on my mind. Problem? No, not exactly. But I've been very concerned about the attitude of a certain Mr. Travis. Mr. Travis? Yeah, he's the miserly millionaire who owns the property next to school. Every time Mr. Conklin makes him an offer, he sits tight on a big fat swivel chair and says, Nothing doing. I take it you're hoping we get the property so we can build a bigger athletic field. Sure. The one we've got now is woefully inadequate. Take our football gridiron, for instance. Did you know that we played our entire schedule this past season on a field that was 15 yards narrower than a regulation field? Really? I never noticed it. That's because we had a very thin backfield. 
<laughs> yeah, I've got another more personal reason for wanting Madison to annex that land, Miss Brooks. You see, one of the acres isn't going to be used at all, and it's a woodland paradise, an ideal spot for picnics and strolls during lunch hour with my lovely Harriet. But, Walter, once you get into those trees, the shrubbery's so thick you can't stroll six feet. That's what I say. It's a woodland paradise. <laughs> it's the feeling I've been all through this. But I'm rooting for the annexation, too, Walter. Maybe Mr. Travis will relent and sell it to us. Yeah, maybe, but don't bet your new mink coat on it. My new mink coat? Well, the one you've got on. That's what it is, isn't it? Not exactly, Walter. It's mink-dyed ray arm. <laughs> oh, I've got to stop at Carney's Garage this morning, Miss Brooks Do you mind walking the remaining six blocks? Oh, not at all, Walter It'll be good for me Keep me nice and trim Yeah, nothing like walking to whack off the old blubber <laughs> How does it look, Daddy? Do you think Mr. Travis will sell Madison the adjoining property? I'm afraid not, Harriet. It makes me very sad. You see, one of the acres wouldn't be needed for the athletic field, and it's a woodland paradise. <laughs> Why, you could send your boyfriend, Walter Denton, into those trees during lunch hour to pick you some flowers. But, Daddy, once you get into the trees, the shrubbery's so thick you can't walk six feet. Walter might trip and break a leg. That's what I say. It's a woodland paradise. <laughs> of course, we might get the property if we could force Travis into selling. Force him into selling? Why, Harriet, wherever do you get such ideas? But, but Daddy, you just... However, said... it might be the only way. But how do we force him? Of course, if someone were to threaten to sue Mr. Travis because of an injury incurred on his property, that might do it. An injury incurred? On Mr. Travis' property? Child, your thoughts are positively diabolical. <laughs> but it may be the solution. An injury and a threatened suit. Yes, the more I think about it, the better I like it. Goodness knows it could happen easily enough. The fence around his land is strewn all over the sidewalk. A person could sustain a fine accidental injury there. But how, Daddy? How do I usually sustain my accidental injury? <laughs> Quite simply, my dear. Miss Brooks drops a typewriter on my foot. <laughs> Miss Brooks closes a door on my hand. <laughs> or Miss Brooks sweeps my glasses to the floor with a pointer. You mean you're going to walk past Mr. Travis' place with Miss Brooks and just let nature take its course? And not exactly, Harriet. We're going to reverse our usual role... This time, I'm casting Miss Brooks as the damagee. One moment, Miss Brooks. Mind if I walk the rest of the way to school with you? Oh, not at all, Mr. Conklin. By the way, isn't this where Mr. Travis's property begins? Yes, it is, Miss Brooks. Why he's making it so tough for us to purchase it is beyond me. Look at the appearance of this lot, full of weeds and broken fence posts. He obviously doesn't care about doing anything with it himself. Perhaps he's keeping it for a burial plot. <laughs> Three acres? Maybe he's the restless type. <laughs> he's a selfish old villain, that's what he is. And a negligent one, too. Why, if someone were to trip over one of these broken fence posts, he could sue Travis for everything he's got. Here, I'd better take your arm, Miss Brooks. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Conklin. Yes. I... Ooh! I almost tripped. You didn't even see that dangerous post, did you? No, sir. Not until you kicked it in front of my feet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, uh, we've got to be more careful. This place could be developed, though. Look up there at those trees, Miss Brooks. The trees? Yes, are... look at the tops of them, how gently they wave in the breeze. Yes, they're very pretty. Uh, oh! Oh, Miss Brooks, you stumbled right over this fence post. Oh, you poor creature. I'm all right, Mr. Johnson. I'll just get up. Don't move. Don't myself. move. You must have sprained your ankle. We'll sue Travis for plenty. But nothing hurts me, Mr. Conklin. Nonsense. Some injuries take hours before they give pain. Oh, let me see your foot. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Just as I suspected. 
It's swollen up to three times its normal size, and it's stiff as a board. You're feeling the fence post, sir. <laughs> Oh, here's your egg. <laughs> now, does it does it hurt when I press here? And uh, no. How about here? No, sir. How does it feel when I give it just this little twist? Oh! Oh, I knew it! I knew it! You can't walk at all. You can't even stand up, can you, Miss Brooks? Not with your foot on my calf, I can. <laughs> and now, please, Mr. Conklin, I'm perfectly all right. Oh, Miss Brooks, are you hurt? I saw you fall from across the street. Oh, I'm glad you did, Boynton. Although Miss Brooks says she hasn't any Oh, pain. my leg. What pain. What an injury. What a switch. <laughs> oh, here, Miss Brooks, let me assist you. I'll just put my arm around you. Now, there. How's that? Fine. What have you got in mind for the other arm? <laughs> Well, I'm glad you saw Miss Brooks incur this injury, Mr. Boynton. With two witnesses, Travis won't dare stand to suit. Now, here, let me help you up, Miss Brooks. There we are. Thank you, sir. Oh, it was nothing, really. You can say that again. <laughs> the way you helped me up was really nothing compared to the way you helped me down. <laughs> Mr. Conklin insisted that I go right home and get in bed. He also insisted on calling Mr. Travis to tell him that I was bringing suit against him. At noon, I was lying down on the couch in the living room when Mrs. Davis came in. Just what happened, Connie? Well, frankly, Mrs. Davis, the whole thing was planned by Mr. Conklin. You see, he thinks that if Mr. Travis is sued for damages, it'll be easier to buy his property from him. Well, I hope it works, Connie. I've never met the man... But from what I hear, he's something of an ogre. Well, ogre is as ogre does. But there's no sense in my lying here like an invalid when I feel perfectly all right. I think I'll go out and stroll around the backyard. Oh, I'll answer it. You stay right on that couch, Connie. The rest will do you good. Why, it's Mr. Boynton. Come on in. Well, thanks, Mrs. Davis. Uh, how's our patient coming along? Oh, just fine. She says she hasn't any pain at all. Who is it, Mrs. Davis? It's Mr. Boynton. Oh, my ankle. Oh. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Davis, I thought you said she didn't have any pain. Well, she's still complaining about her ankle. He must have twisted it harder than she meant to. <laughs> Go on in. I was just leaving. I've got to get down to the Broadview Realty Company. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Oh, hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, well, oh. Uh, I know this was all a plot of Mr. Conklin's, but you must have really hurt yourself in that fall, Miss Brooks. You look very uncomfortable lying on that couch. I am. I'm miserable. Well, here, let me change your position a bit. Uh, just put your arms around my neck. All righty. <laughs> there. Now, we'll just lift you a little higher against this pillow. <sighs> That's better. Mm, it's perfect. <laughs> Miss Brooks. I've never been this comfortable. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> Miss Brooks. I've been comfortable before, I mean, but never this comfortable. <laughs> Miss Brooks. Uh... What are you chattering about, Mr. Boynton? Would you mind taking your arms from around my neck? Oh, I thought they felt full. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Boynton. Yes, Miss Brooks. I'm uncomfortable again. Want to get up a little higher? Higher, lower. Stick out your neck. <laughs> Are you all ready, Miss Brooks? I was born ready. <laughs> I can't help wondering, Mr. Boynton. Wondering what? What it's going to be like to go through life with a sprained ankle. <laughs> oh, it isn't really sprained, Miss Brooks. But you've got to act as if it is anyway. That's one of the reasons I came over here during lunch period. To tell you that Mr. Conklin has arranged for Mr. Travis to come and visit you this afternoon. Visit me? Yes. When Mr. Conklin told him you were going to sue him, he insisted on seeing you personally. Of course, I'm not much of a boy for this sort of chicanery. But as Mr. Conklin explained it, it does seem to be for the good of the school. Oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, there's another reason I hope we get the lot, Miss Brooks. A much more personal reason. Yes, Mr. Biden? 
One of the acres is a woodland paradise. An ideal place for a stroll during lunch hour. But, Mr. Boynton, once you get into the trees, the shrubbery's so thick you can't walk six feet. Well, who cares? Can you imagine the frogs I'll find in there? <laughs> It's a woodland nothing. And what can I do for you, madam? I'm Mrs. Davis. I had an appointment to see about extending the time on my mortgage payment. Of course, Mr. Humphreys usually took care of me. Hey, Mr. Humphreys took care of a lot of people. But as the new owner of the Broadview Realty Company, I've decided to handle all mortgages myself. In nothing like the personal touch, don't you think? Oh, yes, indeed. But about my payment... I'm I... sure we'll be able to work something out. You'll find me a very easy man to do business with, Mrs. Davis. In fact, just last month, I had occasion to deal with another lady customer of ours. Sweetest little person you ever saw. Eighty years old if she was a day. Poor thing was three days behind on her mortgage and seemed worried sick about it. Of course, the minute she called me up, I went right over to see her. Did you put her mind at ease? In a manner of speaking. I drew up a chair right beside her and we had a nice long chat. Right there on the sidewalk. <laughs> her furniture was already on the sidewalk. Yes, but it didn't stay there long. By the end of the day, I'd helped her sell every stick of it. <laughs> but the little old lady, where is she now? She gets out tomorrow. I thought it best to have her put away for 30 days. After all, I couldn't live with myself if I thought of that sweet old soul having no roof over her head. <laughs> I guess I'm just an old softy. Oh. I'm sure you are. But somehow I can't help wishing Mr. Humphreys was still here. A fine fellow, Humphreys. Hey, now, if you just leave the money you owe in a neat pile on this desk, you can run along. But that's what I want to talk to you about, Mr. Uh... Mr. Uh, uh, Travis, R.J. Travis. Travis? You've heard of me? Yes, I have, Mr. Ogre. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you don't have the money for your payment, I don't want you to fret about it. I want you to know that you don't have to pay me until later. Oh, that's wonderful, Mr. Travis. How much later? Well, let's see. Uh, it's now 2.15... Uh, Shall we say 3.30? 3. 3.30? <laughs> but I can't get the money by 3.30. Well, perhaps we can extend it beyond that. It all depends on the humor I'm in when I return from an errand of mercy upon which I am about to embark. An errand of mercy? Yes, I've got to go out and see some idiotic school teacher who claims she broke her foolish leg on a piece of my property. She says she's going to sue me. Oh, no. Now, I'm driving over there right away. Is there some place you'd like me to drop you? No, thank you. I'll take the bus home. It's much slower. Well, it may be all right to threaten to sue someone for an alleged injury, but not when that someone happens to hold a mortgage on your landlady's home. And particularly not when a payment is due on that mortgage. Unfortunately, Miss Brooks is not aware that the someone in both cases is named R.J. Travis, whom she's expecting at her house momentarily. Well, Mr. Travis should be here any minute now, Miss Brooks. Well, I'm sure your appearance will convince him that you're in pretty bad shape. Thanks a million. <laughs> I mean the way I've taped up your ankle. Oh. And not only will it impress Mr. Travis, but the support should do the ankle itself a lot of good. It certainly should. There's only one thing wrong. What's that? You've taped up the wrong ankle. Hey, Miss Brooks, why didn't you say something? Oh, come now. <laughs> uh, I'm sure Mr. Travis will never know the difference. Oh, there he is. Now, you stay right here on the couch, Miss Brooks. I'll let him in. Oh, Mr. Conklin, come in. Is Travis here yet, Boynton? Oh, no, sir, not yet. Oh. It's all right, Miss Brooks. It's only Mr. Conklin. Oh. <laughs> That's right. Get a good rehearsal under your belt, Miss Brooks. We've got to frighten Travis into selling that property. You, I'll get it. And Miss Brooks, start suffering. <laughs> oh, come in, Mr. Travis. We've been expecting you. you. What are you doing here, Conklin? And where else should a principal be but at the side of his favorite teacher in her hour of need? <laughs> <laughs> and where is this great favorite at the moment? 
<laughs> there she is. Really? I thought it was a coyote. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh. There she is, oh. Travis. An unfortunate soul struck down in the prime of her life. A victim of your negligence. One moment a happy, carefree person, the next a human catapult. Hurled toward the ground with such cataclysmic force that a more catastrophic result was only averted by a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> I want the woman to tell me what happened in her own words. I took a Brody. And it happened on your property, Mr. Travis. Who are you? He's Mr. Boynton, a biology teacher at Madison, and Miss Brooks, star witness in her impending suit against you. Isn't he sweet, Mr. Travis? He's a delight. Now, let's get this nonsense about a suit over right now. I refuse to accept any responsibility for this alleged accident. Alleged accident? Why, you have but to take one look at this poor woman to see what a gibbering wreck she's become. <laughs> I'll admit she's no oil painting. <laughs> but for all I know, her face is always twisted into those ugly contortions. <laughs> Only when I smile. Well, now then, let's get down to cases. Miss Brooks is going to sue you for $5,000. $5,000? Oh, look, we're all sensible people here. Let's discuss this thing. I, uh, I'm sure we can come to some equitable settlement. Mr. Travis, are you trying to bribe us? Are you attempting to buy our free people of our stature in this community by offering to sell your lot next to Madison High in exchange for our dropping the suit? Is that the bribe you have in mind? Certainly not. Then you haven't hit on the right bribe. <laughs> oh, look, gentlemen, these legal matters are very distressing to me. If you'll excuse me, I'll go make us some tea. Uh, yes, do that. Hop up and make us some tea, Miss Brooks. Well, I may not hop, but if you'll hand me that cane, Mr. Conklin, I'll try and drag myself to the kettle. Oh, here, I I'd better stand in back of you in case you fall. No, stand in front of me, Mr. Boynton. Front of you? It's more fun that way. <laughs> hey, easy, easy now, Miss Brooks. Let's see if you can walk. Uh, it's all right as long as I don't let my bad foot touch the floor. Why... Honey, what are you doing up? Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Travis. Hello, Mrs. Davis. Why, oh, Mrs. Davis, do you know Mr. Travis? We met today, Connie. Mr. Travis owns the company which holds the mortgage on this house. Like I say, I'll just hop out and make us some tea. Miss Brooks, hold. Now, walk back here, young woman. Yes, limp back here, young woman. I'm afraid that won't work, Miss Brooks. You haven't the trace of a limp. Isn't it amazing? For years, doctors have marveled at how quickly I recuperate. This suit was all a fake, engineered by you, Conklin. Oh, but, Mr. Travis, dear Mr. Travis... If for your information, dear Mr. Conklin, I have a meeting scheduled with the Board of Education tomorrow, at which time I was prepared to sell the property adjoining Madison High. However, thanks to your ridiculous scheming, such a sale is now out of the question. Mr. Conklin, are you all right? I, I just slipped. Why Mrs. Davis keeps these scatter rugs here is beyond me. Oh, my ankle. I think I've sprained it. Well, that's the luckiest thing that could have happened to you, Mr. Conklin. Lucky? Certainly. You've already got three witnesses. Now all we have to do is get a good lawyer, and we can sue Mrs. Davis for the house she's about to lose. <laughs> Now, here's the star of our show, Eve Arden. Well, Mr. Conklin got over his sprained ankle, but he still gets a terrible headache whenever he walks by that woodland paradise. Arnold Swift, starring Eve Arden, transcribed, is produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Arthur Olsberg and Al Lewis, with the music of Lud Gluskin. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, and Frank Nelson. Next 
next week at this same time and over this same station, Eve Arden, in the role of Madison High School's favorite English teacher, Miss Brooks, will again call the student body together. Don't you be absent. Our Miss Brooks is presented each week through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. The life of an average school teacher tends to run along a fairly smooth and even path. But if that teacher's name is Constance Brooks and she teaches English at Madison High School, that path is apt to be not quite so smooth and even. Somehow, while most girls go through life attracting boys... I go through it attracting accidents. Wednesday, as I was leaving Clay City High after a visit with a friend, I hit the jackpot of all accidents. I was walking toward the elevator, my mind off in space, when a few seconds later, so was I. I had stepped into an open elevator shaft. (laughs) The next thing I knew, I was hanging by my fingertips. Jason Brill, Clay's principal, had rushed up and pulled me to safety... The newspaper photographers had taken our pictures, and we were so busy, I didn't have a chance to faint until I got home. (laughs) The next morning, as my landlady and I sat down to breakfast, I slipped the newspaper casually under Mrs. Davis's eyes and waited for her reaction. Finally, it came. In tones quivering with excitement, she said, Connie, what's a two-letter word meaning sun god? (laughs) Mrs. Davis, look! No, dear. Look has four letters. <laughs> uh, maybe I should try it vertical. Now, let's see. What's a three-letter word for feline domestic animal? Yeah. Oh, no. Quiet, Minerva, and finish your milk. <laughs> now, three-letter word for feline domestic animal. Yeah. It's no use, Minerva. Mr. <laughs> Davis, if you forget that crossword puzzle for a moment and look at the front page, you might see a story about a person you know that will interest you. Oh, all right, dear. Well? Oh, oh my. My goodness. Why, Connie, this is your picture. A picture of you and Jason Brill. But what are you two doing on the front page? If you'll read the story, you'll see what we're doing there. A story. Oh, that's right. There is a story. Jason Brill, principal of Clay City High School, played the hero yesterday as he hoisted Constance Brooks, Madison High English teacher, out of an open elevator shaft. Miss Brooks had been dangling by her fingertips three stories up with the elevator a floor above her when she was finally rescued. Oh, Connie, how awful. But, dear, I don't quite understand. Don't quite understand what, Mrs. Davis? Wouldn't it have been simpler to wait for the elevator like everybody else? Not with my claustrophobia. (laughs) Mrs. Davis, the whole thing was an accident. A horrible, nightmarish accident. Oh, of course, dear. Were you hurt? No, I'm all right today. Now, please don't worry about me, Mrs. Davis. I have as many lives as... No coaching, Minerva. (laughs) Don't you want to read the rest of the story? I'm reading it now. Mr. Brill, who is currently one of the principals being considered for promotion to assistant superintendent of schools, was extremely modest about his daring rescue. When asked to comment, he said, This is nothing that any other aggressive, vigorous, alert, level-headed, courageous man wouldn't have done under similar circumstances. If he printed his whole comment, he would have been elected to Congress. (laughs) As it is, I doubt if he'll make assistant superintendent. At least not while Mr. Conklin is also trying for the job. Oh, is Osgood still after that position? Like Dick Tracy is after Rughead. Why, today our boy unveils his Project X in front of Mr. Stone. Project X? Goodness, it sounds important. What is it, dear? If I know Mr. Conklin, it's probably a scientific method of making six teachers do the work of one principal. Frankly, Mrs. Davis, I'm dying to find out about Project X myself. Mr. Conklin's promised me that this morning he's letting the cat out of the bag. Yeah! Right back in the 
bag, Minerva. In any case, Connie, it might be a good idea to drop in and see your principal before your first class. He'll be so relieved to see you unscratched. He'll fuss over you like a cat over her baby kitten. <laughs> yes, Minerva, they're playing our song. <laughs> Mr. Conklin, in perfect health, none the worse for wear, not a scratch on me, and ready to start the day's work with a brave smile, so don't you worry one bit. <laughs> Sit down, you traitor. <laughs> yeah? Mr. Conklin, didn't you read the story about me in the morning paper? Seven times. <laughs> Miss Brooks, you knew I was in a life and death struggle with Jason Brill for assistant superintendent. You knew that making him a hero would practically ruin my chances. For lo, these many years, you have been enjoying all of your accidents right here at Madison. <laughs> and now, when I need you most, why did you have to take your business elsewhere? <laughs> it was rather thoughtless of me, sir. And I was so confident that when I unveiled my Project X before Mr. Stone at three this afternoon, it would dwarf all of Brill's recent projects. But now, it is. Hero uh, is this your Project X, sir? This desk microphone and the instrument panel with push buttons? Uh, yes. Yes, it's an amplifying system. Sitting right here in my office, I can press buttons and hear what's going on in any classroom or hallway. I can check on my teachers and students at any time. The Board of Education was delighted when I suggested they try out the system at Madison. Would you show me how it works, sir? Uh, well, I had promised my daughter Harriet she would be the first to hear it this morning, but... I don't know what's happened to her. Oh, I'm certain she wouldn't mind if I heard it first. <laughs> no, I suppose not. Well, all right, I'll flick it on. We'll uh, warm up with room 100, although it may be unoccupied at this early hour. Oh, come on, Harriet. Just one little kiss. <laughs> <laughs> no, Walter. Daddy wouldn't like it. Who wants to kiss him? <laughs> Harriet, one teensy weensy little kiss. Denton, unpucker this instant. What? Harriet, you know you're getting to sound more like your old man every day. <laughs> well, that wasn't me, Walter. Well, don't tell me it's my conscience talking. <laughs> Denton, this is your principal talking. And no conscience ever shouted like that. <laughs> Holy cow, now Miss Brooks' voice is coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> Well, that's my Project X, Miss Brooks. And if you hadn't made a hero out of Jason Brill, it would have been enough to sway Mr. Stone in favor of my promotion. I tell you frankly, if Mr. Stone selects Jason Brill for that job, I'm going to be in a very ugly mood indeed. <laughs> yes, sir. I will hark back constantly to the incident that caused my defeat, knowing always at whose doorstep to lay the blame. You can imagine what may occur. Yes, sir. For the next six months, you're liable to trample all over my welcome mat. Well, since I had made a hero out of our principal's arch-rival, Jason Brill, Mr. Conklin felt that I had cost him his promotion to assistant superintendent. Just before lunch, Mrs. Davis phoned to find out how I was feeling, and I gave her a rundown of the situation. Connie, I'm amazed at Osgood. Do you mean he wasn't a bit happy to see you up and around? He acted more like he wished I were down than under. <laughs> he feels I've cost him his promotion. Well, he's just upset, dear. Why, with a wonderful project like that amplifying system, he should be able to walk into that new job. Over a road of broken eardrums. <laughs> that system is driving us all crazy, Mrs. Davis. He listens in on us in the classrooms and the hallways and the recreation room. A few minutes ago, I had the shock of my life in the female faculty room. My goodness. Well, Osgood is just sulking, Connie. Still, it would have been better for you if he had been the hero. Well, it's too late to worry about that now, since... Mrs. Davis, what did you just say? Well, I said... Uh, oh, goodness, Connie, I'm afraid I wasn't paying attention. What did I say? Yes. Why not? 
No, I'm certain I didn't say yes. Why not? <laughs> Mrs. Davis, you're a lifesaver. Well, goodbye now. I've got to meet Mr. Boynton in the lunchroom and break the good news to him. Good news? What good news, Connie? That at 3 p.m. today, he's going to be rescued by Mr. Conklin from a terrible accident. <laughs> Say, that pie was better than they usually make down here. Yes, it was. Oh, now, you said you had a big favor to ask me. What is it? Uh, yes, I did want to ask the favor, Mr. Boynton, but perhaps I'd better not ask it here. You know who might be listening in on us right now. Who? Which who? Oh. Yes, that who. <laughs> I wish I could whisper it to you, though. Bring your ear over closer. Now, listen. <laughs> that tickles. <laughs> you know, you sent a chill right down my spine. Care to do me now? <laughs> I mean, let's just talk in low tones. Oh, Miss Brooks, believe me, you're worrying needlessly. I'm sure Mr. Conklin has something better to do than listen in on lunchroom conversations. But if you're worried, why don't you just write down what you have to say on a napkin? What do you think of that idea? I think it's the sneakiest thing I've heard today. <laughs> Mr. Conklin. Gosh, you were right, Miss Brooks. Don't get panicky, friends. Just follow me across to the unoccupied zone of Madison High. <laughs> We'll be perfectly safe from him here in the boiler room, Mr. Boynton. There isn't a wire in the place, see? Uh, still, he's here, Miss Brooks. I can feel it in my bones. This, this room is wired, too. I know he's here. Mr. Boynton, look. I'll prove to you once and for all that Mr. Conklin has no wires down here. Here's a paper bag on the floor. I'll blow it up and explode it near the ceiling. Watch. Get up off your knees. I can't hear you. What happened to my eardrum? Where is everybody? Mr. Conklin? I can't hear you. Say something, somebody. Please. Please. Mr. Conklin, can you hear me, sir? Talk, somebody. I can't hear you. Say something, somebody. Go jump in the lake, fish face. <laughs> for yourself, meathead. <laughs> you hear what I called him, Miss Brooks? If it's a question of your getting the Medal of Honor, I'll be your witness. <laughs> well, now that Mr. Conklin can't hear us, what was that big favor you wanted? Mr. Stone is coming over at three this afternoon to hear the amplifying system in action. And when he presses the button to hear what's going on in your laboratory, I was wondering if you could be in the midst of a fake accident yelling for help. Oh, I see. You mean if I have this fake accident and Mr. Conklin saves me, Mr. Stone may pick him for that promotion and we'll be rid of him and his amplifying system. You ain't just burning your Bunsen, Boynton. <laughs> That's right, I mean. Now, just in case Mr. Conklin has regained his hearing, let's go outside and talk over the details. No, oh, all right, Miss Brooks. Uh, follow me. This back door leads to the athletic field, and I'm sure that... I'll never hear us here in the boiler room, Harriet. Not a chance. Believe me. But are you sure, Walter? Well, just to play it absolutely safe, I'll test. Ah, oh, come on, Harriet. Give me a kiss. Just one little kiss. Yeah, it's okay, Harriet. If he'd heard me, his bark would have exploded the boiler room by this time. <laughs> now, what do you think of my plan? Well, making a hero of Daddy in front of Mr. Stone sounds pretty fantastic to me. Fantastic? What's fantastic about it? It's simple. When Mr. Stone tries out the sound system and contacts the boiler room, I pretend the water pipes have exploded and I'm practically drowning. And then Daddy hears you hollering, dashes down and rescues you, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. Now, what could be... Uh, oh, Harriet, I just got a terrible thought. What? 
If your father ever really thought I was drowning, he'd let me. While making a hero of Mr. Conklin in front of Mr. Stone seemed like an ideal way to get him his promotion, particularly if it occurred while he was demonstrating his new amplifying system. However, unknown to each other, Miss Brooks and Walter Denton happened to get the idea at the same time. So as Miss Brooks approached her principal's office that afternoon, she knew nothing of the mix-up. Oh, uh, Miss Brooks, just a moment, please. Oh, I'm Mr. Conklin. I was just about to stop in your office on my way home. Can you hear all right now? I can hear all right, but my head feels like the inside of the Holland Tunnel at high noon. <laughs> However, let's forget the boiler room caper, shall we? Now, listen, I have a favor to ask of you, a big favor. Mr. Stone is in my office at this very moment, and I'm about to demonstrate my amplifying system to him. Oh, I wouldn't worry about getting that promotion anymore, sir. Accidents have a way of happening at the strangest times, making heroes of the strangest people. I have a feeling one may happen very soon. Why, Miss Brooks, how did you find out about the accident I'd planned? <laughs> you planned an accident? And you will play a key role in it. What are you going to do, push me off the roof? <laughs> oh, what a perfectly delightful... <laughs> Uh, Miss Brooks, this accident again involves an open elevator shaft. If you look ten feet in front of you, the shaft is open. Oh, no, sir, not again. Don't ask me to do it again. My fingertips are all worn out. (laughs) We've got to act quickly. I've made arrangements with our home economics teacher, Miss Miller, to cling from that open elevator shaft in exactly two minutes. At that time or before, you will come into my office screaming for help, and I shall bound to the rescue. Oh, well, before you go, sir, we'd better synchronize our accident. You see, I have And don't to... worry about Miss Miller. Even if she does let go, it's only a four-foot drop, and I have several mattresses underneath to break her fall. Uh, but, sir, believe me, it won't be necessary... Do as I say, Miss Brooks. Give me a moment or two with Mr. Stone, and then go into your act. Uh, but, Mr. Conklin, I... Ah, there you are, Conklin. Say, this is quite an efficient-looking acoustical setup you've got here. Oh, thank you, Mr. Stone. Well, it's only natural for a principal whose only concern is his school to want to improve its operation. And as you know, sir, in all my years at this school, my one thought, my one aim has been how I can become assistant to how I can better conditions here at Madison. <laughs> I'm well aware of that, Osgood. But now I'd like to hear this amplifying system in operation, so... Uh... <laughs> Miss Conklin, come quickly. Something terrible has happened. Miss Miller has fallen down the elevator shaft. She's clinging to the ledge this very minute. What? Fallen down the elevator shaft? Good heavens. Why, Miss Brooks, it happened to you only yesterday. Yes, sir. I must have ushered in the season. (laughs) Well, what are we standing around for? A human life is in peril. Clear, quick, decisive action is called for. And if there's one thing about Osgood Conklin, he is never one to lose his head in emergencies and turn his... Conklin! Stop filibustering and save her. <laughs> oh, yes, monsieur, yes, at once. Yes. This is terrible, Miss Brooks, simply terrible. I think we'd better contact someone to give Conklin a hand. But how could we contact anyone in time for him to do any good, well, sir? I could try using the amplifying system. I withdraw the question. <laughs> exactly. It's only a little after three. Some teachers must still be in their classrooms. Mr. Boynton usually stays late to work in his lab, doesn't he? Maybe he can lend a hand. Oh, no, sir. I've been trying to borrow one for years. I've... Well, oh, I'm certain he's gone home. Well, nevertheless, there's no harm in trying the biology lab. Now, where is that button? Oh, yeah, here we are. Help! Help, Mr. Conklin! Save me! Please save me! These poison gas tubes are choking me! Ooh, help me! <laughs> Something's happened to Boynton. What's going on down there? Sounds like the deathbed scene from Camille. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, will I do? <laughs> For quick action, Miss Brooks. The boiler room is the closest place to the biology lab. I'll contact the school custodian. Ah, oh, yes, here's the button. Help! Save me, Mr. Conklin! No. Go, they really go. <laughs> oh, save me, Mr. Conklin! Save me! Miss Brooks, just why is everyone all over the school calling for Osgood Conklin? Maybe Philip Morris is busy. <laughs> uh, sir, I'm sure that.
that? What you heard? What I heard is plenty. It's all beginning to add up, Miss Brooks. Well, maybe if you subtracted those last two accidents. Well, I saved Miss Miller. She almost pulled me down into the shaft with her, but I broke her death hold on my ankle and pulled her up by the hair. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually nothing. Nothing at all. I agree with you. Hey? You feel quite the hero, don't you, Conklin? Then suppose you get your rescue squad and save this poor soul. Oh, save me, Mr. Conklin! Poison gas! Gas all over! Save me! Why, it's Mr. Boynton. I, I rushed right Hold down. Hold it, Rover Boy. <laughs> we have another customer for you in the boiler room. Probably going down for the third time. <laughs> So shoot me. But I, I don't understand. What are they all doing? Miss Brooks, why are they all yelling for me to save them? I don't know, sir, unless they're mistaking you for St. Bernard. <laughs> Believe me, Mr. Stone, I had no hand in all this. I'm an innocent man. Uh, do we have any more accidents waiting for us, Conklin? That's all we had on the calendar for today, sir. <laughs> oh, I'm innocent, Mr. Stone. Believe me. Ah, I'm... here we have a button marked roof. What little game are we playing up there, Conklin? Oh, nothing, sir. Absolutely nothing. That's for emergency air raid spotting. Well, we'll try it anyway, shall we? Save me, Osgood, for goodness sake. Save me. Save me. Margaret Davis? But what's she doing on the roof? Miss Brooks? Don't ask me, sir. I'm still trying to figure out Walter. Save me, Osgood. I'm stuck on the television aerial. I think I've heard enough. Conklin, I don't know whether to bring charges against you or just continue to tolerate your occasional lapses into complete idiocy. But one thing is certain. Neither you nor Jason Brill will be recommended for that promotion. Neither one of them? No, Miss Brooks. And don't try to tell me now that you didn't stage that Perils of Pauline act yesterday, too. Mr. Stone, that's not true. I had a real accident and I earned every bruise of it. <laughs> Miss Brooks. At this point, I don't know whether to believe anyone has had any real accidents or not. So, good day to both of you. Well, at least Brill won't get the job. Oh! Help! What was that? Oh, it's Mr. Stone, sir. He fell down that open elevator shaft. Now, isn't that a shame? I knew if we kept on pitching, sir, we'd make it sometime today. Mark Transcribe was produced and directed by Lou Derman with the music of Bud Gluskin. Kill the thing. What's that got to do with Harriet not talking to you? Well, I began kidding her about the fact that girls always go to pieces in an emergency. So one word led to another, and she ended up not speaking to me. Well, I guess I shouldn't have teased her about something that's obviously so true. You mean you really believe that men react better to emergencies than girls do? Your oh, present got me accepted, of course. <laughs> but then I never think of you as a girl, Miss Brooks. <laughs> Thanks a million. <laughs> What I mean is you'd never get into a panic over a little thing like an insect. Of course you wouldn't. Neither of us would. Oh, I know it, Mrs. Davis, but you're different. Oh, for instance, that little mouse running across the floor doesn't bother you two in the least. Mouse? Ah! You go on upstairs, go on, beat it, go on. There, he's gone, Miss Brooks. You can relax. Oh, I'm perfectly relaxed, Walter. I was just a bit startled, that's all. Yeah, I know. You can get down off that chair now. Oh, yes. Mm. I'm surprised at you, Connie, climbing up on the chair. Where else could I go? You're on the table. <laughs> oh, so I am. 
I was wondering how I suddenly got so tall. <laughs> yeah, you see what I mean? All women react alike in emergencies. Uh, look, Walter, just because we were a wee bit upset by a mouse is no reason to think we'd be over-emotional under any other circumstances. Please notice how rapidly I return to normal. Right now, I'm as calm as can be. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Miss Brooks, while you pull yourself together. Hello, Davis residence. Walter Denton speaking. Oh, hello, Walter. This is Mr. Boynton. Could I speak to Miss Brooks, please? You'll have to wait until she gets a grip on herself, Mr. Boynton. Gets a grip on herself? Yeah, she just saw a mouse. Miss Brooks and Mrs. Davis were leaping on chairs and tables like a brace of gazelles. <laughs> oh, boy, it almost knocked me out. Hand me that phone or I'll finish the job. <laughs> hello, Mr. Boynton. Oh, hello, Miss Brooks. Hey, what's this about you and Mrs. Davis leaping on chairs and tables at the sight of a mouse? <laughs> I, I wish I'd been there. <laughs> I wish you had, too. There was an extra chair. <laughs> but I'm sure you didn't call up just to laugh at me, Mr. Boynton. Oh, now, don't get sore, Miss Brooks. I'm not sore, Mr. Boynton. Not in the least. I suppose you share the popular belief that all women get panicky in emergencies. Well, it's a known fact that men are cooler than women are in tense situations. But it's nothing to get angry about. I told you I'm not angry. If you want to call up and laugh at me, that's your business. If you choose to insult me by telling me how quickly I go to pieces, that's up to you. Oh, but Miss Brooks, But to I... accuse... Now, it's our Miss Brooks starring Eve Arden. In the year she has been teaching English at Madison High, Armis Brooks has learned a few cardinal rules concerning her principal, Mr. Conklin. One was to be punctual always. Another was to be agreeable at all times. And a third was, never cross your principal until you came to him. <laughs> Bearing this in mind, when Mr. Conklin suggested a method a few weeks ago of beating the high price of meat, I listened very carefully. His idea was for a few of us to chip in with him and buy a whole steer and keep it in a frozen food plant. Thus, it would make good meat available to us at a reasonable price whenever we wanted it. The scheme sounded feasible, so my landlady, Mrs. Davis, and Mr. Boynton and I joined the Conklins in his project. It worked perfectly until this past week. Thursday morning started out just like any of the others had since Ferdinand had entered our lives. Connie, you've hardly eaten a thing. Don't you like your breakfast this morning? I should say I do, Mrs. Davis. This beef stew is delicious. <laughs> but I've had enough of it. I had a hunch you'd say that. You should. I've been saying it since Monday. <laughs> I'm sorry I had to serve this four-day-old stuff, Connie. But since we bought that steer, we've had more meat than we know what to do with. And anyway, I... Oh, that's probably Walter to pick me up. Come on in, Walter. The door's open. I hope he brought his appetite with him. Maybe he'll do away with some of this meat. Or vice versa. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Good morning, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Walter. You look a bit gloomy, dear. Yeah, I am. Would you like a bite to eat? That usually cheers you up. You, what do you got? How about a slab of beef on a nice pointed stick? You no know, thanks. <laughs> now, I'm in big trouble with Harriet Conklin. Well, why not sit down and try a little of our stew? That ought to make you forget Harriet for a while. That ought to make him forget everything for a while. <laughs> You're eating beef stew for breakfast? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We've been battling it for the past four days now, Walter. Oh, well, the way I feel this morning, I couldn't eat a thing. I'm never hungry when Harriet isn't talking to me. What happened this time? Well, it all started over a little thing at the Conklin's last night. I was sitting in the living room with Harriet and Mr. and Mrs. Conklin when suddenly Harriet spied a large insect, a praying mantis, to be exact. Well, they're perfectly harmless, but you've never heard two women scream the way Harriet and Mrs. Conklin did. Oh, oh they were terrified. Well, in the midst of the commotion, Mr. Conklin calmly took off his shoe and... It's not that you aren't a good cook. It's not that I am, either. <laughs> well, I'm in kind of a spot, Miss Brooks. I have no meat for the table tonight and no money to buy any. Well, that shouldn't be any problem. Why don't you go down to the refrigeration plant and 
pack a few yards off the dinosaur of the cattle world. Well, that's just it, Miss Brooks. Mr. Conklin forgot to pay the rent on the frozen food locker, and they told him today that none of us could go near our steer until the rent was paid. He doesn't have the money. You know what this means, Miss Brooks. Vegetarianism is about to get some converts. <laughs> Look, I'd like to help you out, Mr. Boynton, but I haven't any money either. Oh, I wouldn't ask you for money, Miss Brooks. But I have a little scheme. The scheme? Mr. Conklin, Mrs. Davis, and I are all known at the locker since we've been there many times to pick up meat. But you've never been there, have you? Not so far. Good. Well, just before closing time, there's only one man on duty. Now, if you could act as a sort of decoy and get him away from his desk for five minutes, I could sneak into the refrigeration room and get some meat. Now, do you follow me? Yeah, but who have we got in the getaway car, Lefty? <laughs> It's our own steer, Miss Brooks. We'll straighten out the rent bill later on. Now, will you help me? Well, where do you stand on male superiority in emergencies, Mr. Boynton? Oh, now, please, Miss Brooks. This isn't the type of emergency we were talking about. I just meant that women have a tendency to fall apart under pressure. Well, don't look now, but your decoy has just disintegrated. Oh, but Miss Brooks... Sorry, you'll just have to get someone else. <coughs> well, I'm sorry I've made you angry again, but if that's the way you feel about it, I... We'll have to get someone else. There isn't much time, so if you'll excuse me. It's a pleasure. Well, see you later, Miss Brooke. Much later. Of all the nerve, asking me to help him, and then I should have dropped this noodle soup right into his lap. Men are the limit. Sometimes I wish... Well, there's no sense in going overboard. <laughs> you must have money in the bag. Or were you rehearsing a speech for your class? I'm afraid you're wrong on two counts, Mr. Conklin. No matter. Miss Brooks, I'd like to make amends for my curt treatment this morning. Look, I've brought you a little gift. Why, Mr. Conklin, you shouldn't have. And it's just the color I like, too. Yes, I remember that you take your coffee black. <laughs> Do you mind if I sit down? Not at all. Take this chair. It's still warm. Uh, would you come straight to the point, Miss Brooks? I have a little favor to ask you. I never would have guessed. I wouldn't dream of asking it, except in this dire emergency. Could you find it in your tender heart to lend me ten measly dollars until payday? I couldn't find ten measly cents in my measly heart. I'm flat broke, Mr. Conklin. I was afraid of that. Further, would you, Miss Brooks? Not with my salary check due tomorrow. <laughs> that is, no, sir. Very well. Now, Harriet, I want you to go home immediately after school and help your mother prepare for our dinner party tonight. She broke her silence long enough to call and tell me she wanted you. All right, Daddy. You're having a big dinner tonight, sir? Uh, yes, Miss Brooks, for several members of the Board of Education. That steer we bought certainly comes in handy. Without it, I could never have invited all those important people. Oh, that reminds me. I'll have to take a trip down to the refrigerator plant this afternoon for some steaks. I could lend you some beef stew. Uh, no, thanks. <laughs> Well, I've got to get back to my office. I hope you two will voluntarily break up this cafe clutch. Or will I have to get a mouse and stampede you? <laughs> oh, I said a mouse and stampede. <laughs> oh, I will have my little joke. That's <laughs> right. Now, you see, Miss Brooks, doesn't that attitude make you furious? It certainly does, Harriet. There must be some way to eliminate it. There is. But where can we find a long enough wall to line up the male population of the United States? Well, at lunchtime, I was still quite incensed over Mr. Boynton's attitude toward female inferiority in emergencies. He must have realized how I felt because as he approached my table in the school cafeteria, he had a peace offering in his hand. Where some men give their girlfriends flowers or candy after an argument, Mr. Boynton's gift was more original. Here, Miss Brooks, I brought you a plate of noodle soup. <laughs> noodle soup? Is this to be construed as a peace feeler, Mr. Boynton? You might say that, yes. Well, it's got a lot of noodles in it. Well, if you think you can bribe me with lavish gifts, you're mistaken. Now, I'll thank you to leave me alone if you have nothing further to say. Oh, but I have, Miss Brooks. Yes? What am I going to do with the soup? Use it as a finger bowl. <laughs> Young rope with the noodle. Excuse me, Mr. Boynton. No, please, Miss Brooks. There's no reason for us to be on the outs like this. 
Look, do you mind if I sit down for just a minute? There are no reserved seats in the cafeteria, Mr. Boynton, so there's not much I can do about it. Well, I, I don't know how we got into that argument on the phone in the first place. Now, you see, my folks came into town unexpectedly, and you were the first person I thought of to help entertain them. Your folks? Yes. I called to ask you to play hostess at a little dinner party I'm giving them at my place tonight. Well, that's very flattering, Mr. Boynton. I thought you'd appreciate it. I mean, you, you've always seemed to like my folks. And, uh, well, now I, I need your services for something else, too. You want me to cook the dinner? No, Dad's stomach hasn't been too strong lately. <laughs> oh. Excuse me, of being sore and angry is more than I care to take. The next thing you'll be saying is that I'm mad. That's just what you're thinking, isn't it, Mr. Boynton? No, please, Well, for your information, I I am neither sore, angry, nor mad, and neither you or anybody else can accuse me of it. Do you hear me, Mr. Boynton? Neither you or anybody else. Oh, Miss Brooks, please try to cool down. I am cool. I'm cute as a cool cumber. (laughs) I mean, cool as a cucumber. Oh, good. And I'll tell you what I called about. I know what you called about, and it's typical of your sneaky nature to call when it would embarrass me the most. Goodbye. My goodness, Connie. You shouldn't have gotten so peeved at Mr. Boynton. Well, I hate being told that men can handle emergencies better than women, Mrs. Davis. I know, but there's nothing you can do about it this minute, dear. Maybe not. But the way I feel now, if a mantis gets in my way today, he'd better pray. <laughs> a minute. Oh, good morning, Harriet. Oh, I'm glad I caught you before you went into your first class. I wanted to talk to you. What is it, dear? Well, you've probably heard about the enormous insect at our house last night. Harriet, that's no way to talk about your father. (laughs) Oh, you mean the praying mantis. Yes, I've heard about it. Well, since last night, Mother and I have heard so much about male superiority in emergencies that I'm not talking to Walter and Mother's not talking to Daddy. Well, don't look now, but Mr. Boynton's just joined the club. (laughs) You mean you're not speaking to Mr. Boynton either? Why? Was there a praying mantis at your house, too? No, just a mouse. Mrs. Davis and I became a bit unnerved when we saw one, and Walter blabbed about it to Mr. Boynton on the phone. Oh, I see. What about Mrs. Davis's cat, Minerva? It's a good thing she wasn't there. She'd have been more frightened than any of us. <laughs> well, I wish there was something we could do about uh, it. Here you are, Harriet. Good morning, Miss Brooks. Good morning, Mr. Conklin. We were just talking about you. Oh, did Harriet tell you how I slew that enormous praying mantis last night? <laughs> yes, sir. I understand you're having it mounted for your trophy room. <laughs> Miss Brooks, casting aspersions on my courage is most ill-timed coming as it does from one who has spent the better part of the morning perched on a dining room chair. Why, that little stool pigeon. I wouldn't have brought up the episode had you not made your disparaging remark. It's hardly necessary to reiterate a truism we are all aware of that in emergencies, large and small, men are much superior to women. Daddy, you have no right... Silence! (laughs) You wouldn't care to discuss the point.